Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for attending today's session. Um, my name is Denny. I'm a developer advocate at Databricks, but the real person who actually knows what they're talking about is Ankit here. So we're going to have him do most of the conversations, actually. So, But we are here to talk today about DBRX, or DABAREX. I'm trying to make that a thing, by the way. So I want you to start saying DABAREX. We're always debating with each other. So there's, some are saying DBREX, some are saying DBRX, but that sounds like a prescription. So I'm trying to avoid that one. So hence, DABAREX is the one we're going for because that way I can toss away, um, I don't have any today unfortunately, but I can toss away uh, dinosaur, toy dinosaurs because you know th that's how we make things fun. Okay, we've got a lot of slides, but we want to make room for lots and lots of questions, okay, about how DBRX was built, why we're building it, the, pro the methodologies, the processes, things of that nature. And that's what we're going to go through today. And we're going to start right into the architecture. And again, we got somebody who actually knows what they're talking about right there instead of me, okay? But uh, let me at least provide the basic principles in place first, okay? So what is DABAREX, okay? It is our very own open source large language model, okay? I hopefully everybody here knows what an LM is, yes? Yes? Okay, good. I just make sure. So, so I'm just, I've actually went to middle schools and they actually all knew, already knew the answer too, so that's actually pretty sweet. Okay, so just want to make sure. That's all, okay? All right, so we have the base version, which is a pre uh, our pre trained model. Think of it like a smart autocomplete. That's not the one you're usually chatting with, but that's the one that you often will go fine tune or do whatever else do you want to do with it, okay? But now, DBRX Instruct, that's the chat version of it, the fine-tuned version of the model, which is really good for the, the chat GPT style, that what we're all sort of used to doing. Okay? It's designed to basically answer questions and follow instructions. Uh, it's built on top of <coughs> excuse me, uh, on very domain-specific and fine-tuned instruction-following data. Okay? That's basically what every other instruct or chat version of these models does. So not much difference there. Okay? So if I'm going ahead and running, this is an animated GIF, and uh, we have it actually on all of our blogs. <laughs> so, but basically it just shows you running Llama 270B. Now, <laughs> pause for that second. That's Llama 2, not Llama 3. Llama 3 was just dropped 9 a.m. this morning. Okay, it's a very, very fast and fast moving system. Again, I'll have Ankit go ahead and cover it. So this is Llama 2 because I, we graded this demo three weeks ago. Okay, so sorry, we're not up to speed yet. Okay, but so right now, if you're running them side by side, it's extremely fast. In fact, within the Databricks uh, uh, platform, we're actually able to get 150 tokens per second, which is pretty sweet. But the key thing that we're calling out is that it's trying to find a balance between being extremely knowledgeable but also very fast. And that's actually what we're gonna dive into a little bit with the architecture a bit, okay? So it outperforms many, not all, because Llama 3 just came out today. Mixtral uh, 8x22B uh, came out technically two days ago, I guess. The base actually was last week, uh, so it's also uh, very, very good, okay? so. But the open source models that we were able to talk about, for example, in terms of like Llama 2 70B or Mistral, this is the, uh, the older version of it, Grok 1, uh, it basically outperforms it for programming, for language understanding, for mathematics. Okay? And then you'll see benchmarks like MMLU or Human Eval, which is the worst name ever for a programming benchmark, okay? uh, or uh, GSMAK, which is basically the mathematics. Okay? Uh, this also, the, we've got more slides like this for, uh, for basically for MLU. Again, just showcasing how we've helped build a model that is extremely good. And again, if you're going to ask me the question, hey, but how does Llama 3 do or how does Mistral 8x22B does? No, they do better, okay? This is not us trying to m claim that we're always going to be king of the mountain. We were king of the mountain for what, three weeks? Maybe? Yeah, yeah about Absolutely. three weeks, okay? That's cool. For in the JNAI space, that's pretty good, okay? <laughs> All right, we even outperformed uh, ChatGPT 3.5, okay, which is pretty sweet, okay. So that's that's what these numbers are showing. Uh, so this is just a quick radar plot showcasing uh, again the older version of Mistral Instruct, uh, Llama 2, again 2 70B, and ChatGPT 3.5. And you notice that basically the bigger the plot, the more it can cover in terms of the different benchmarks, and that's exactly what DBRX was able to do, which is again really sweet. Okay, but now we're going to dive in a little bit in the architecture, and then boom, I think this is where Ankit will take over. Awesome. Well, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, my name's Ankit. I'm one of the engineering leads at Databricks for uh, what we're calling the Mosaic AI platform. Um, and I'm super excited to talk about uh, DABOREX, DBREX, whatever we want to call it. It's, uh, it's, it's an open source model. Um, 
So I, I've been doing this for a while, and that counts as like six months, basically, in Gen AI. No, I'm kidding. I, I mean, we've, we've been doing a lot in, in, in this space for uh, a little bit around a year. But this space moves incredibly fast, um, which is super, super exciting, because uh, it's kind of one of the moments of frontiers of a new technology. And every day, almost, it feels like something new or interesting is happening. And so we wanted to show a little bit about that, right? So like the, our, our friends at Mistral, uh, which is a great company also producing open source models, put out this uh, tweet actually a couple of days ago when they released their new model, Mistral 8x22b. Since then, these models have all come out. Um, and so you know, that's an insane amount of progress on the Pareto frontier of model quality versus cost. Um, the model that we're really, really excited about today um, is Llama 3, 8B, and 70B, uh, which are now available on our platform uh, for folks to use. Uh, and they're extremely high quality. Uh, you might notice I had to expand the y-axis of this graph to cover Llama 3, 70B, uh, which scores around 82 to 83% on MMLU. Um, that's really awesome, because that model is open source. Everyone can use it. The community can build on it. Um, and that's you know, what we already saw with Llama 2. Over the last year, thousands of model variants have emerged that are derivatives of Llama 2. And you know, this is a story that's been told by open source for, for many years. And we see it play out in Gen AI as well. So today is actually a big day for open source LLMs. But we think that for enterprises to be successful with open source models, they need to customize it with their data. The product that I've built over the last year and a half actually helps enterprises deploy these models in their Gen AI applications. And it's still super early for everyone. Most folks are in the POC phase, and anyone who's in production is very likely using a closed source open AI model. So it's incumbent on us in the open source community and those of us who serve open source models to find a way to make enterprises successful so that they can actually leverage the open source. Um, but in order for that to happen, these, the models they're serving need to be faster and still high quality. The differentiator there is data. Uh, and the nice thing about open source models is that they have open lineage, and the data can be private to a company, so they can create a version of their own model that's based on the open source. So what is the point of us building DBRX? Why, why did we do that? We actually built it as a demonstration of our platform. We built the whole model on Databricks with Spark for data preparation, ML Flow for experiment tracking, and LLM Foundry and Megablocks for training. These are all open source projects that Databricks has released and that are available natively and in a vertically integrated way on our platform. And that end-to-end -end solution is actually what we provide to enterprises, which we call Mosaic AI. Um, and what we showed with DBRX is that we're able to produce soda quality models from that. But like I said, right, the base model is not the game that we want to play. The game we want to play is actually making customers successful by fine tuning or fully customizing that base model on their own with their data and their tokens. But we can first dive into the architecture. We did a lot of really interesting things there uh, to actually make this model state of the art quality. So it's still a transformer based architecture. Um, and you know, there's a lot of technical terms here, but basically it's the same as all the other open source LLMs, right? It was created entirely from scratch by us. One thing I wanted to call out is it was actually pre-trained on publicly available online data sources. We did everything by the books here. Uh, no customer data was used to train DBRX. It was trained on 12 trillion, trillion tokens of carefully curated data. Um, we didn't train on any tokens from any other quality language models. So this is you know, pretty pure. And that's required for folks to actually be able to use open source. There can't be caveats in the license or caveats in the data that prevent people from using it. Um, so we use a bunch of tricks here, including stuff like what we call curriculum learning, which involves basically at the last kind of stage of the model, teaching the model in a different way. Uh, and the model is able to support 32K tokens worth of context. Maybe just as a first check here, like raise your hand if you know exactly what a token is. So, you know, like that's a good fraction of the crowd knows, but, but I'm just gonna define it anyway. A token is maybe like three fourths of a word. And that's kind of a weird definition, right? But like, 
you know, if you asked me if I knew what a token is, like I don't actually have a good intuitive sense of what it is. For example, ing is a token, but run is also a token. And so you can kind of think about like complex constructions of words as being one or two tokens. So you can treat it roughly as one token is three fourths of a word. So what does it mean to have 32k tokens worth of context? It means that you can pass in a book to this model. And it's able to reason about that book and then give you an answer about that. That's super important for enterprises who are largely using these models to actually look up manuals or long pieces of data and then answer questions about them. We trained the model on 3,000 plus NVIDIA H100s. That's a big cluster. Uh, Pre-training, post-training evaluation, the whole process took us around three months. So why is this model so interesting from an architectural point of view? It's because we actually used a different kind of model architecture called mixture of experts. And it's an open secret in the community that this is what OpenAI's GPT-4 is built on. Uh, what this means is that there are, there's actually, you can kind of think about it as a lot of different sub-models. If you had a matrix, there's a lot of different blocks to that matrix. Um, and so that means that there's 132 billion parameters worth of tokens, uh, worth of, uh, of, of weights. Um, but when the model is running, only some of those experts are activated. And so only 36 billion parameters worth of those experts are activated. So it's, it's not quite this way you know, in practice, but in reality, the way you can think about it is 132 billion parameters worth of knowledge exists in this model, but only 36 billion, the right 36 billion, is used at the time of inference. That's really, really important because it makes the model smarter, but still fast enough to actually be useful and interesting. One of the number one things we've actually heard from our customers as we launched the model is like, wow, we love the speed. Because that's really what matters to the, to the end user, um, in addition to quality. So yeah, you know, there's some details here. We use four of the 16 experts. Um, there's a lot of combinations. Uh, there's a bunch of technical details around the actual kinds of encodings and, and linear units we use. Uh, and these are pretty interesting as well. Uh, you know, for folks who are interested in this area, definitely recommend diving into our white paper on the model, where we go really deep on like why we used gated linear units, group query attention, and things like that. Um, and we use uh, the tokenizer that we use, the thing that converts words into tokens, we use the, just the GPT-4 one, because we want it to be easy for people to transition from closed source models to open source models. Yeah, one thing also I want to just to chime in real quick about that last point. A lot of this is based on the latest research, okay? Just, just as Ankit was calling out, like the latest research, like G, Gen AI is moving really, really fast, right? Well, it's a lot of it has to do with the research. So we're actually, one of the whole reasons why we have Mosaic research in the first place is because we're keeping up with the latest research to try to understand which set of research is actually applicable versus which set of research may, maybe we're gonna need to let it cook a little bit more, okay? And so these are some of the latest pieces of research that we've merged in. And again, as each model comes out, Llama 3 just came out today, Mixtral came out you know, two days ago, things of that nature, we're taking account of, okay, well, some of the research is really cool, some of the research eh, might work out. For example, just to chime in one tiny bit, Mixtral was based on this idea of megabox, a sparse um, MOE. Ankit's going to cover that out. Well, guess what? That is actually a Databricks project, right? So some of the latest research that we see that was really good, we've open sourced it, and we made it available for everybody to work with. So just want to chime that in real quick. Yeah, and, and, and actually to, to, to riff on that, one additional thing that's really interesting in this community right now is that a lot of what used to be the case, which is that academia is producing interesting open results, is no longer the case in this community. And that's really unfortunate. But it's a consequence of massive amounts of compute being required to test any of these ideas at scale. Right? I mean, like look, those 3,072 NVIDIA H100s, that is an incredibly expensive cluster. Um, and most other companies like, you know, are not actually publishing the results that they get at scale because their models are closed source. By open sourcing this model, we actually are showing people that hey, Rope and GLU and GQA, we, we tested these things. They actually really do work. And you should, you should use those. And you need to, and in fact, they work at scale, uh, which is not something that you, know, you get to see in academic papers, unfortunately. Um, so let's dive a little bit into that. Um, I'm not a part of the research team. I'm on the applied side. Uh, but I'm good friends with a lot of the research folks. And, and they did a really great job with this model. 
Um, we have an open source library called Composer that we use uh, for deep learning. Um, uh, and it's optimized for scalability so that you can get really, really good performance out of these GPUs. We have an open source project called Streaming Dataset, uh, which allows us to really quickly stream the right batch uh, elements into the actual GPU at the right time and then get rid of them so that we have minimal MR usage when we train the model. Uh, we combine that kind of a thing into this thing called LLM Foundry, which is a package that we basically kind of use that you can drop in, it's open source, and you can train on you know, as many H100s as you have with that package. Uh, and finally, we evaluate the model with an evaluation gauntlet, which is also open source, and it's a library used for evaluating these models in a statistically um, equivalent way. So this is a really interesting area where everyone has their own numbers that they publish. The numbers that we publish are always derived from our open source evaluation framework so that everyone can reproduce them. Yeah, so just to, again to chime in and to provide some little, little bit of context. So when you talk about uh, Ellen Gauntlet, we've got about 30 plus different benchmarks across six different categories that are put together. Versus, for example, the, H, uh, the Hugging Face LM leaderboard, they, that's a, it's a composite of about six or seven different uh, benchmarks. It's okay, we're not trying to compete in this, this case, we just, it's more about, there's a lot of really good benchmarks out there. We want different levels of detail. Some folks prefer the hugging face one. Some prefer the evaluation gauntlet. Some people will just want to show MMLU, which is the most popular one because that's about language understanding. Nevertheless, that it, we're not, this is not us knocking one or the other. Quite the opposite. There's so much out there. So trying to track it and make sense of it can be very difficult. And so again, that's what, part of the reason why the research team open sourced a lot of this stuff, so you can all validate, leverage, review, understand exactly what we're doing. Okay? Yeah. Um, and, and the key element that unites all of these things is that we have a really strong focus on performance. Without a strong focus on performance, open source models are not trainable by the community because it takes too long to train those models, and it's too expensive. We open source a lot of our performance improvements so that folks can actually leverage those by default in the open source community. We often do that through LLM Foundry. Sometimes we even upstream changes into PyTorch for this exact purpose. Um, we did also use a lot of different other uh, products within Databricks. Uh, we, uh, actually, there was a smaller company called Lilac AI, which has a really, really great tool around data exploration and curation. Um, and you know, we, we knew them from other things and, and actually used their product really, really heavily. And we loved it so much, we ended up acquiring the company. Um, their product is really, really useful for NLP, uh, like just text exploration, constructing your data set, really understanding your data. That's, that's what we're about kind of at Databricks. Um, but that data is like 12 trillion tokens worth of data is a lot. So uh, we have this thing called Apache Spark, which we used to train data uh, and clean that, that data, and it was super, super useful for us. Um, it, it cut down the amount of time to do pre-processing from the order of months to the order of weeks, which was really imp impactful to our timeline. Um, all of this data, is, it's critical that it be, have lineage and that it be stored in a way that's governable for enterprises, so we have a governance solution called Unity Catalog in which all that data lives. Um, and then, yeah, we have a training pro uh, product and platform that we actually use to train the model. Um, and MLflow uh, is what we used to do experiment tracking. And so uh, that one's really close to my heart because I started out my career working on MLflow um, in the open source. And so I, I think it's um, really exciting that we were able to use all these open source tools. We serve the model in our foundation model API service. That's what I work on. Um, and uh, we have a playground for folks to evaluate the model and red team it. Uh, there's a lot of open source projects that we used here, and we wanted to call them out. Uh, Megablocks is one uh, started by my friend Trevor Gale. Actually, we were in the same lab, um, sat across from each other at Stanford, and uh, we actually loved Megablocks so much. I mean, other folks use it, like, Mis like Mistral. Uh, we recently brought it under the Databricks umbrella of open source projects. Um, PyTorch FSDP is the basis for our distributed training library, uh, and PyTorch is an incredible open source project that uh, we've really loved, we work really closely with the PyTorch team. And don't forget the Linux Foundation project too, right? So. <laughs> yes. Uh, so is MLflow. So is MLflow. Um, yes, it's true, true. Uh, and uh, we used uh, VL, you know, we, VLLM and TensorRT LLM are both open source serving frameworks that we contributed to the day we released the model. Um, we leverage versions of these within our own stack in the product that we sell. 
Um, and we off, we, you know, we're, we're one of the leading contributors to TRTLLM and also to VLLM. Uh, also wanted to thank Eleuther AI, which is an open project for their LLM evaluation work. We uh, collaborate with them a lot on, this, on that kind of stuff. And uh, folks at the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, who uh, helped us a lot on the data side in particular. And they're based here in Seattle too, just FYI. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, how does the model do? Well, it's amongst the best models uh, when it was released uh, uh, that are commercially viable open source models. Uh, you know, when we compared it to Mixtrol and Llama 270B, uh, it was substantially better. On leaderboards, uh, we're doing a lot better than Mixtrol. Um, one of the scores that we're the most proud of is actually human eval. Um, and like Denny said, it's very confusing. That's actually a programming benchmark. Um, but on that programming benchmark, we're actually crushing code-specific models. So like Code Llama, for example, is trained purely with the Llama architecture from code tokens only. So it's just a code model. Um, and we're beating that model with many fewer active parameters. Remember, I said 36 billion of those parameters are active. So it's almost twice as fast as Code Llama 70B while being higher quality on code. Um, and this is actually, you can see it reflected in stuff like the chatbot arena, where they recently broke down the scores by task, and our model is higher than GPT 3.5 quality, and as the top open model still on coding in the chatbot arena. Uh, so we haven't yet had a chance to uh, run human eval on Llama 370B, but we're really excited about where it's going to land. Uh, so I think for, for folks who use code in the open source, it's going to be a really exciting development. One of our goals was to make it so that we had a model that was open, that was better than the closed models we see being used in enterprise. Uh, so we were really excited about this result. In fact, like even though GPT-4 is the highest quality model, most folks in enterprise are using GPT-3.5 due to its really, really good latencies and low cost. Um, DBRX can be served with lower cost than GPT-3.5 and has higher quality. Um, and that's really resonated with a lot of folks that we work with. I think that actually might still be true relative to the Llama 370B model, because again, it has half the active parameters. So um, you know, on, we have a lot of internal use cases as well. Um, on our SQL-related internal use cases, DBRX surpassed GPT 3.5. It's actually right up next to GPT 4 on those internal SQL-related use cases. Um, uh, we're obviously at, we're outperforming on MMLU, which is a great benchmark, but uh, programming and mathematics are things that we're really excited about. Conversational abilities are something that we lag on, and we want to be open about that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're still working on, you know, this is like the first checkpoint of, for us, and we're going to continue improving this model um, and have more exciting announcements around it. Another thing that we see that's really common in enterprise is long context tasks. And there are very few good evaluation benchmarks on that. So we're really, if you look at the scores here, we're, we're really excited about how DBRX is doing on long context. In general, long context is tricky because even if you pass a lot of tokens into the model, it does, there's this kind of problem where it forgets what's going on in the middle of that thing. Uh, and so we actually specifically had that in mind and trained the model to be good at long context. Our enterprise customers who, are in, who are, have tried out the model with their production use cases are actually really excited about that. Um, we, we do want to be, like, GPT-4 Turbo is definitely the best model in this area. It's actually better than GPT-4. Um, and then, you know, retrieval augmentation is another important task that people care about. DBRX is outperforming open models on that. Um, and RAG is kind of the one thing that everyone is doing with these models in enterprises. So the way that we think about the benchmarks we care about is actually not necessarily gaming for MMLU. We're really more excited about our RAG evaluations, our long context evaluations, um, and our speed, because those are the things that the enterprise customers are really giving a lot of uh, interest in. I wanted to really briefly cover the training stack. Um, we did evaluate the efficiency of the model uh, when it was served. We conducted internal red teaming. Um, and we evaluated the benchmark on, uh, rel uh, I guess, DBRX instruct is a fine, it's kind of, you can think of it as a fine-tuned model, right? So 
We've compared it with other equivalent fine-tuned models on you know, a variety of these benchmarks. Uh, but if you look at our, our training efficiency, that's something that comes out of our open source training stack. So you know, the amount of what we call flops, floating point operations, that, uh, that were required to train this model is way fewer than a dense model because the MOE architecture is, a, like the, the stack that we have is able to train MOE models at a much higher overall utilization of the GPU. What that means is that you're getting better value in terms of like, let's say for any given second, you're improving the quality of the model by some amount. You're getting increasingly high value on that with our stack. So this is like kind of you know, something that we've open sourced. We've given a lot back to the open source community here in LM Foundry and folks have picked it up and comp have picked Composer up and actually been able to get these improvements in the training stack automatically. Um, you know, inference is something that's close to my heart. This is what my team works on. Um, FM API, like, so we call it FM APIs, Foundation Model APIs. DBRX achieves 150 tokens per second, which is insanely fast. That, that's like humans can read at 100, maybe at 80. Hmm. So this is faster than you can read by a substantial amount. Um, and what that means is that even if you hit it with a lot of concurrent requests, It'll slow down a little bit, but it's still really, really fast. Um, and so in general, there's a trade-off for enterprises. You either get quality that's slower, or you get less quality but faster. And so here what we're delivering is something that's 2x faster than Llama 370B, which is a number from this morning, um, because it has half the active parameters. So Llama 370B might be higher quality, but if you need a little bit more speed for the same amount of quality, we're able to provide that on this MOE architecture. So we have some benchmarks here, um, which we're super excited about. And these are, these are actually much harder to become outdated because uh, the bigger models like 70B, like the quality might improve, but the actual inference efficiency doesn't change. So you know, we've got like a benchmark here, or like you, you know, a GIF. Uh, I think maybe Denny showed yeah, this I one. Yeah, I think we showed this one earlier. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, my bad. Yeah, no, that's fine. It's always fun for me to see like how fast it responds. <laughs> so we're really, like, you know, it, it's really awesome that the time to the first token was maybe half and the speed was almost 140 to tokens per second there. So, uh, you know, we actually do love our own model on the serving stack, but we are really kind of more about delivering open source models to enterprises at Databricks for the model serving stack. So that, ju that doesn't just include deep, uh, Dabarex. It also includes Mistral, uh, Meta's Llama 2 and 3, um, and a couple, of, like, you know, Hugging Faces, Starcoder. We allow you to serve Langchain models, uh, you know, Llama Index, Chains, your own Python code if you want. And if you do want to go the route of using a closed source model, you can always use OpenAI governed through our model serving platform. So why do we allow, you know, what, what I'm really excited about here and a, and a journey I go on with a lot of customers is most people are going to start with the highest quality closed source model. But by giving them an open source alternative with the same API in the same platform, we can actually achieve a, a way to actually switch that towards open source. So yeah, we're super excited about how the model is doing. We think it's the best choice for enterprise. Wanted to hand it back to Denny to talk about how you can try using the model. Perfect, thank you. And so just to add to what Ankit was covering, yeah, we've got 10 minutes left, so perfect. I'll, this will be only a minute. Um, it's, it's an emphasis on how efficient we can process the data. Again, we went ahead and actually placed a lot of that learnings directly back into LM Foundry. But also there's a call out, consistent call out to, to this presentation about how high quality is your data. If, you've, if the better the quality of data you have, 
the better your model is going to turn out to be, right? And then this is the reason why we're talking about this idea where it's not about necessarily building the one big model. That's what most companies are not asking for. What they're doing is they're trying to get multiple models to be designed for, uh, multiple smaller models designed for their specific use cases. That's why you hear us talk about RAG, right? Uh, retrieval augmented generation. And so that's the call out, that a lot of that stuff, giving you, your, comp your customers, your companies, that flexibility is ultimately what it comes down to. And uh, again, trying to find that balance between extremely knowledgeable, but also extremely performant. Now, how do you try it? Uh, like of everything else, go out of Hugging Face. There's a Databricks uh, DBRX base and DBRX uh, instruct right there. There's an AI, if you want to use Databricks, all the more power to you. There's the playground, uh, the AI playground or the foundation model API that you can go use right away. Um, U.com and Perplexity AI within, I think, a day of us releasing the model already put <laughs> there are our models up there, which is really sweet. Uh, those are definitely things you can use. Uh, I've got some screenshots about, like, for example, uh, r running DBR Instruct. Um, and Hugging Face, in this case, uh, you can definitely use it for free. And I actually asked the question of what are the techniques to make a proper espresso? Its answers are quite good, actually. So uh, if you may or may not know me, I'm a bit of a coffee snob. So actually, these answers are good. <laughs> so um, if you want, again, the AI Playground, you saw the, the animated GIFs. That's what this was. So I'm going to skip through that one. This is me uh, actually interestingly answering what the, to summarize the Megablocks paper. So when I originally didn't know what the Megablocks paper was about, I said, OK, you know what? I'll just ask. Dabba Rex for it, and then sure enough, boom, it explained it to me really nicely. U.com, put a little animated GIF there. Perplexity, put a little uh, screenshot there. So relatively straightforward. I also have a bunch of links here. Uh, so I'll, I'll work with the uh, LF folks to make sure you have a version of this, these, the slides. Basically because uh, we have little gists, uh, gists, excuse me, on how do you locally query uh, DBRX using the foundational API running from your own laptop. How do you go ahead and do it, uh, use DBRX with PySpark AI? So if you want to use the PySpark AI project to generate PySpark code, um, then guess what? That, that little trick there allows you to go do that. Um, also, a llama index is a very popular tool for using uh, for, for, for RAG. Guess what? We also have that a little ability uh, for using DBRX with llama index. All of it's free, downloadable. Now, how do I go ahead and run this on my, uh, my laptop? I'm just going to pause and hopefully this demo works. We'll find out, okay? And this is what happens when you try to run stuff live. Uh, all right, so I had already warmed it up, and so you guys should be able to see. Yes, okay, cool. So I'm going to ask. Oh, let's see. Sure. Um, okay, it's asking the question, uh, Moscow. Let me make it a little bit bigger so it's easier for you to see it. All right. Now this is running on my own personal laptop. Okay. So then I asked the question. Okay, uh, what is the population of Moscow? All right, and it should run. We'll find out if it actually does. There you go. There you go. Perfect. All right. All right, uh, 12 million, what year is this from? So what you'll notice is there's, on the right side, there's a spike of the blue. Sorry, um, let me move this over so you see it. There's a spike of the blue there, okay? Uh, and that spike of the blue, sorry, are you seeing it? Just, okay, perfect, sorry, sorry I just couldn't tell from the angle. Um, the spike of the blue is basically the GPU that's being pushed, okay? And you'll notice that the CPUs are uh, outside the efficiency ones, which it doesn't really matter. Uh, the performance ones are not being talked at all. In other words, I'm using running DBRX right on my laptop right now, okay? So, uh, you, uh, and then of course, uh, Jonathan Frankel, who's the chief uh, scientist uh, for neural networks at Databricks, is going to hate this answer, okay? So just calling that out. Which bagels are better, <laughs> Montreal or New York? Let's see what happens, because this is random. I don't know what the answer is going to be. All right, perfect. All right. P multiple times I've ran this, and it has given me, the my personal opinion, the correct answer, which is Montreal bagels are better. Y yes, that's right. Montreal bagels are better. That's right. OK, so I'm calling that. Jonathan hates me for this, and he constantly beats me up for it. But you'll notice it's com it coming directly from the laptop. Now, saying this. This is the Llama CPP project. It is a heavily, heavily quantized version of the DBRX model. Mind you, the model just literally had been pushed in, I want to say, over the weekend. Okay, So it was just done by some folks in the community. They basically took the project and basically updated Llama CPP to handle the MOE architecture, number one. And then afterwards, they went ahead and quantized, heavily quantized it so it could actually fit on a 64 gigabyte uh, uh, RAM laptop. 
Okay? Now, there's a 4-bit quantized version of it, which is better quality, uh, uh, created by the folks over at Apple uh, using Core ML. That one is probably be more nuanced <laughs> answer than the answer that you see here. Uh, but that one all requires you to have 96 gigabytes. So I, that's why I'm running this one, because at least I only, only need 64. Okay? So, so this is just a little bit of fun we have here right now. That's all that is. But ultimately, the point is that there are multiple ways for you to try out uh, uh, DauberX, okay? including playing with the laptop. So the TLDR from everything, uh, as we wrap up for the next last minute or so, basically, it's a DBR is a state-of-the-art, high-quality, open-source model. It sets a very leading, I want to change that from new standard to leading standard now, because again, with Llama 3 and Mixtral coming out, we, can't, we, no, we no longer can claim the king of the mountain anymore. Um, it, compared to proprietary models, DBRX Instruct surpasses GPT 3.5 and is competitive with Gemini 1.0 Pro and uh, Mixtral Medium. Uh, the fine grain uh, sparse MOE architecture with 132 billion total parameters. I think we've probably hammered those numbers over and over again too much. Uh, only 36 billion of them are used. Four 16 experts are leveraged when we do such a thing. It's built as a combination of Mosaic research, Databricks, and the AI community. This would not happen unless we're working closely with both the research communities and the open source communities. Okay? This works because we all work together. Okay? And that's a fundamental belief that we have, not just from Databricks, but all of us who work here, okay? on this idea that we want to work with open models. Okay? All this other stuff about GPT-4 tokenizer, MOE architecture, we already covered it. So, but the, that's the key thing here. I want to sort of leave that context. as a, That's why openness is so important, because it allows us to improve our, not just you know, each company's usage of these models, but actually improves the actual models themselves, the new techniques that we're all going to try and use. We're all learning from each other. That's why I have, like, he slept very little, I've slept very little, not because we're overworked, well, actually we are, but that's not the main reason. We're super excited about this stuff. The, the, the fact that we're breaking new ground almost every day basically wakes us up anyways. Which is, that's why this stuff's so exciting, basically. So I think, yeah. This is how I'm going to end it. If you want to learn more, there's some even better experts than us, us two lowly peons. Okay? There's Naveen Rao, uh, a VP of Generative AI from Databricks, a formerly CEO and co-founder of Mosaic, and also Jonathan Frankel, chief scientist, neural network, uh, former co-founder of Mosaic ML as well, and of course, lover of New York bagels and uh, you know, where I piss him off. But you can register for the webinar on April 25th at AAM, where we dive into all these things as well. Okay? And I think that's it. Yes, that's it. So uh, hopefully we've covered most of what you want. And uh, I think that's it, right? Yeah, we're good. All right, perfect. Yeah. Uh, we'd, we'd love to hear any questions you have. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about the license that you chose to use? Yeah, uh, I, I, have some, I can talk a little bit about that. Sure, license. go for it. Okay. Um, so we, we basically went with a license roughly resembling, resembling the Llama 2 license. Um, and, and that's. Uh, Kind of what we went with there. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so there are different you, grades of. Okay, whenever anybody asks what is an open model, okay, there's actually going to be very, very different debates on this one. Okay, so one of the things that we're actually, uh, and in fact, I was just talking to Nancy early this morning about it. We're actually working with the Linux Foundation uh, on their open model, uh, uh, basically a matrix. Okay, in terms of what is what's the level of each openness. The reason we went with the Llama twos is a combination of it's out there, so it makes it easier. Number one, but just as important as that is also the fact that um, there's often derivatives that are um, I'll, I'll use the word spicy, okay, that are invalid or things that we don't want to actually happen to the models. So that's the reason why we follow the same Llama 2 model. Now, saying that, we are also working with the LF specifically to specify which grade of openness, quote unquote, that we actually follow. So that way, it's a lot more transparent. The problem is that depending on who you ask at what time, they have different answers to that question. And that's the reason why it's, it's, I can't give you a straightforward answer yet, because we all go through this problem right now. OK? So. Yeah. I mean you know, from my point of view, I don't think there's anything in our license that prevents the community from using the model. Yes. It also doesn't prevent enterprises from using the model. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the folks who are mostly prevented from using the model are like Meta or <laughs> CSPs themselves. CSPs. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Cool.
Yeah. Yes, my um, if I want to fine tune DVRX uh, with my own enterprise data and my own private cloud. If I want to fine tune DBRX with my own enterprise data on my own private cloud, uh, what do I need to, you know, how many GPUs do I need? What do I need to spec out for the infrastructure? Yeah, um, I would look at somewhere between uh, 32 to 64 GPUs uh, to fine tune it. And what type? H100, A100, one of those two. And does that vary by the, the, the fine tuning data set? Uh, Somewhat, but not yeah. too much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, as, as you can tell, it's not a cheap thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> if you want a software stack, though, you can pick up the LM Foundry and it'll work right. out of the box. Yeah. And, and part of the reason for the for its existence of LM Foundry, by the way, is also it's a lot more efficient. So you can actually make use of the GPs you have with a lot. Le you don't actually have to. Uh, you don't have to basically have it running for three months straight, right? We, you're a lot more efficient. That's why we're able to build this DBRX in three months, right? We and sure we had you know basically <laughs> three thousand plus GPUs, so a little bit more, right? But the reality also is that. If you were trying to do the same trick last year, which uh, you know, like even GPT 3.5 or 4.0, or, or we're talking a heck of a lot more GPUs than we than we're talking about right now. So there's a massive amount of efficiency that we're putting in, and that we also place into the open source community by basically upgrading and optimizing Helm Foundry. So yeah, yeah, so we're not there yet where I can just run it on my fine tune on my laptop yet. I'm, we're trying to get there, but we're not there yet. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Cool. In the middle. Sorry, could you repeat that for the stream? Sorry, this is kind of like the 1.0 release, I'm guessing. So you're gonna you're planning to like reiterate, iterate, and improve and release further versions in the future, right? Yeah, we, we've got an aggressive roadmap around the model um, and around generally our capabilities in the space. Um, so we're doing more stuff on this front. Awesome. I think there's a question in the back. Will you be providing this in any of the cloud providers, like at Azure or AWS or anything like that? Uh, so we, it, it is already provided as part of Databricks in those clouds. Mm -hmm. So Azure Databricks is part of Azure. Uh, and so if you're on Azure, you can just start up an Azure Databricks instance. We have um, the product that I, I work on called Foundation Model APIs. It's available there um, on a per token pricing basis and, and also for production use cases with uh, your own endpoint. End and does Databricks provide services to do fine tuning? Like we do, we do, okay. yeah. So like, you know, for those folks who don't have 32 to 64 H100 GPUs, we are happy to provide those and we charge pretty uh, reasonable prices for fine tuning. <laughs> cool. Thank you. All right, well then thank you very much everybody. Appreciate it.